people have asked my opinion on what is the mark of the beast, who takes the mark, is a certain medical procedure that's been out there for a couple of years, is that the mark? Has the beast already arrived? And to be honest, I haven't actually taken the time, at least it hasn't come up until just recently, where I really felt the need to actually go into the deep dive about the mark of the beast. In the process of doing this Bible study on the mark of the beast, the people who take the mark, what happened was I, I opened up a much bigger um, theological problem or issue than just taking the mark, what is the mark of the beast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a Bible study on the mark of the beast. And what I'm doing is I'm actually going to take you through the process that I've used to discover the people who are going to take the mark, what's the deal with them. And I'm going to, in the process, also describe how to do a Bible study. So people have asked me about that in the past too. How do I do a Bible study? Nobody has taught me how to study the Bible. I read the Bible, but I don't get out of it the things that you get out of it. So how do you do this? All right, so I have some words up on the board here today, and these are big theological words, but don't let them throw you. The concepts behind them are very easy to understand. So we have two approaches to Bible study, all right? One of them is called exegesis, and the other is eisegesis. Okay, exegesis comes from the Greek words meaning um, being led out of or leading out of. Ex, exa is out, okay? Like the exit is how you get out of a building. So that's an easy way to remember it here. And eisegesis is where you actually read into, okay? So you're taking a passage and now you're reading something into what you think it says. Exegesis is where we take the passage, we pretend like we don't know anything about what it says, and we let the passage tell us. Now I'm going to tell you something here right at the outset, Eisegesis is really easy, okay? Exegesis is hard, and it's going to take you time. And if you don't want to spend time in Bible study, then you're going to probably do this route right here, which is the easy way, but you're going to end up in places that may not actually be biblical. And that's one of the things that I've noticed about a lot of people who want to interpret prophecy, especially Revelation and other prophecies as well that they want to just do it the easy way over here. So they're going to take some concept, they're going to read something into the passage, they're, they might do a word study or two, but they haven't taken the time that it takes to do the big picture study. Now, you know, there's a difference between devotional reading and Bible study, Okay, and then Bible study where you do your own Bible study and you're not dependent on somebody else's Bible study. And I strongly encourage everybody to do their own work, to do their own Bible study. Don't just trust what other people believe. <laughs> Don't just believe what they say. Everything needs to be weighed out. Um, even in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, I think it's 12, where it talks about people prophesying, people speaking for God. In, in, in the church setting, when the believers are gathered together, that there's a couple of people who speak, and then everybody else is supposed to weigh out what that person said. All right, so this is not something that we typically do in our normal churches, our, our normal churches that really aren't normal. If you have a pastor standing up front and he's speaking, Nobody else in the congregation is authorized or expected to challenge anything that the person said. But the scriptural thing is, is that somebody speaks and then everybody else is supposed to weigh in on what was said. Okay, the fact that this never happens in, in most churches, like I can't imagine it ever happening in any church that has a pastor that's the regular teacher, whatever. If this isn't happening, what you're going to end up with is a, a bunch of people who do not know how to discern what's going on. They have no practice in it, and they have no 
um, forum for being able to challenge or speak to whatever that person up front has been saying. What I do in my channel is I solicit comments because I want to hear what all of you have to say. I may not agree with everything you have to say, but I, I appreciate your making comments because this helps me to um, isolate issues that I may have not thought of, you know, that I'm, I need to rethink. And nobody has it all sewed up tight. Nobody. Nobody knows everything there is to know about the scriptures, the Bible, God, prophecy, or anything. And that's why we all need to do our part in doing the Bible study. Okay, so exegesis means you're going to read the text you're going to kind of pretend like you don't know anything about what it says. And you're going to go on a hunt. And this is a lot harder than finding a text and going, oh, I think I know what that means, and now explaining what you think it means. So what I've done in my show notes, and these are just notes, okay? I just want to tell you there is no... Um, this, this is a process. I'm, I'm showing you how I do Bible study, okay? This is a process. I do it the hard way, okay? I do it the way that's going to take me time where I'll, I'll have to sit down for several hours and think about something, do some research, think about it while I'm, you know, doing other things, gardening, doing dishes or whatever, mulling things over, asking questions, to me, that's one of the most important things about exegesis is that it's not you're not making statements about something, but you're asking the hard questions about it. About what are the implications of the mark of the beast, for example? What does it mean to take the mark? Is there anything that precludes people taking the mark? Is there any any special qualification of mark takers? Okay, so you just have to develop the um, ability and the desire to be curious and to ask questions. Okay, so what I've done is I'm just going to read you something here, uh, excerpts from it anyway. This is from... Um, gotquestions.org, which for the most part is a very helpful um, Bible study um, tool that you can use. I don't agree with everything these people say, but I think they're helpful in a lot of ways. So when you go to gotquestions.org and you type in the search bar there where um, you can type in a question, whatever, type in exegesis and or and or eisegesis and it will come up with you know what is it what are these things and I'm, I'm going to explain it to you I'm going to use what they've said and I'm going to just kind of add to it so that you can understand the difference in Bible study we're not trying to make a sermon here find a passage and then make some nice blanket sermon statement you know a little homily or whatever we're trying to find out what does God saying what is he saying in his word? These are opposed, conflicting approaches to Bible study. So when you do exegesis, that is, you want to take the text, you want to draw out of the text what's in the text. In other words, you're digging for something and you want to pull it out. This is how you do it according to gotquestions.org. First, you're going to make observations. What does the passage say? Okay, you're just going to observe it. And then you're going to ask questions, well, what does this mean? You're going to find out how this passage relates to other places in the Bible. And there is a phrase we use for that, scripture interprets scripture. And then they put in application here. And, you know, I don't necessarily always look for application. I don't think every passage has application for us in terms of personal application. But um, if there is an application, of course, we want to apply that. So eisegesis involves imagination. In other words, what, what idea do I want to present today? You know, what, what do I want to say? And then, are there any scripture passages that back up my ideas? And thirdly, um, what does this idea mean? Um, does you know, is there any kind of application about how people should live their lives and so on and so forth? Exegesis is concerned with discovery, okay, digging and making discoveries. And eisegesis is about making a point, okay? You, you, you have something, a point you want to make, 
and you're going to find some verses to do it. And sometimes it's a, they're good verses to use for that, and sometimes they're not. Okay, there's an example that they give here in um, gotquestions.org. That is a really, really good example, and I'm going to use it. The difference between exegesis and eisegesis. All right, so here's a passage, really short, 2 Chronicles 27, 1 and 2. Jotham, who was a king, was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for 16 years and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord just as his father Uzziah had done but unlike him he did not enter the temple of the Lord okay so here's uh, Jotham good king but he didn't enter the temple of the Lord like his father did all right so if we're going to use eisegesis First, what happens is we decide on a topic, and the topic is we're going to talk about church attendance today and, you know, that it's important to go to church. So you read this passage in 2 Chronicles, and you see that King Jotham was a good king, like Uzziah, except for one thing, he didn't go to the temple. Well, this passage seems to fit really good with the whole idea of church attendance or going to church. And the resulting sermon then would be, you know, something like we need to pass on godly values from one generation to the next. And just because King Uzziah went to the temple every week didn't mean that his son would continue to the practice of going to the temple in the same way many young people today don't go to church and so on and so forth. So a cursory reading of 2 Chronicles 27, 1 and 2 would seem to support the idea that you, a child will, will not follow the example of their father. And, you know, in this case, Uzziah went to the temple, but jo uh, Jotham didn't. And so um, we're going to use this passage to explain, you know, that, it's, that sometimes the next generation doesn't do the things that the previous generation did. Okay, so... That would be, you know, a case of eisegesis. But is that what this passage is really saying? Okay, so this is this is now the hard way, but it's going to be the way that we get the correct interpretation of this passage. So first, the interpreter or the exegete, okay, is going to read this passage in the context and then going to read a history about Jotham, and we're going to read a history of Uzziah. In this example, the, the passages where we read more about those uh, two kings are in those passages in 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings. And as you read those passages, you discover that King Uzziah was a good king. He was a good guy. But there was a day when he wanted to go into the temple and offer up incense, and only the priests were allowed to do that. And then he contracted leprosy while he was in the temple doing this bad thing and spent the rest of his life in isolation. Okay, so now we're going to be going in all kinds of other places in scripture. Okay, we've just been led down. Why is he going to have to live in isolation? Well, we'll read in Leviticus 13 that if you're a leper, you have to live outside the camp. We'll also read about how the leprosy or illness was a punishment for his sin. That's in 2 Kings 5, 2 Chronicles 16 and 21. And by the time you're done researching the life of Uzziah, you realize that when the passage in 2 Chronicles said that Jotham didn't go into the temple, that was actually a good thing because Uzziah went into the temple not, not to go to church. He went into the temple to do something he was forbidden to do, which was offer incense like he was a priest. So if you were to give a Bible study or you were to preach on that, it wouldn't be about how children need to follow their <laughs> parents' example and go to church. It would be the problems of disobedience and going and doing things that are beyond your um, call or your station or your prerogative, things that God has not assigned to you. The thing is, most people who do Bible study, and I, I'm talking even preachers in, in pulpits, are not going to take the hard way here, which is looking at all of the 
all, all of the leads and the research and I mean it's research okay it's like you know, doing a doctorate or a master's degree program or, or anything where you're going to have to actually dig in to the source material and you're going to have to pull out relevant um, information and make connections, create a hypothesis, and so on. All right, so you have to approach the Bible in this, with the same kind of integrity that you would approach any other kind of study. It's not about just, you know, finding some passage and then sort of, you know, reading it and going, oh, this must mean that. Does it? Do you know? Do you know what else the Bible says about those things? And because this kind of Bible study takes more time and more effort, it makes it harder, okay? But it also makes it more rewarding, and it's what faithful workmen do. When Paul tells Timothy, that we're supposed to rightly handle the word of truth. This is what it's talking about, to, to actually take the time to take our Bible and do the hard work, okay, to handle it rightly. Now, I'm just going to say this. Not everybody um, has the patience. Not everybody has the wherewithal. It isn't not everybody's wired to do this sort of thing, but we all can ask questions. We all know how to use the internet or we wouldn't be here right now watching a video. Okay, there's Bible helps. Like I like Bible Hub. It's the one I recommend. I think it's the easiest to use. You can go there. You can type in a passage, click on it, and there will come up all these resources for you cross-references, what, what do the words mean, where are other places in the Bible that talk about this. Okay, so we're going to use exegesis to discover about the mark of the beast and the people who take the mark of the beast. People have said to me that if you take a certain kind of treatment, that what it does is it changes your, um, your D and your A. Okay, it changes that and it makes you not human and then you will be not redeemable and that means that everybody who's done this thing is no longer a Christian or is no longer going to be saved, is going to have to go into the reign of the beast and so on and so forth. Some people point me to passages in Revelation 6 that talk about this sword, that's the kind of dagger that's sort of like a you-know-what that goes into your arm. That the rider on the white horse has a bow. And if you look in the Greek, it, there's this one occurrence of this Greek word toxon, which means toxic. It's poison. And so, um, and the other thing is that this is a piece of cloth. And so we must be talking about a mask and something that's toxic which is probably this injection thing and so on and so forth. Okay, can you see how we're reading things into the text? We're not letting the Bible speak for what it says. Those passages there don't have anything to do with a mark. They, have no, they say nothing about the mark of the beast at all. They don't say anything about that. There are plenty of passages in Revelation that talk about the mark of the beast, the people who take it, the people who don't take it, and what are some of the things that are connected with people taking the mark. And that's the stuff that we need to be researching. We need to take the stuff that's actually talking about the mark and use that as the source material for discovering what is the mark who are the people who take the mark. So my process that I'm going to use for studying about the mark of the beast is I'm going to take all the passages that talk about the mark of the beast, that has anything to do with the mark, that um, talks about people who take it, people who don't take it, and I'm going to put all those passages in one place, which I've done. I've listed out numerous passages here in Revelation. It's, there's several couple pages here anyway, with the context where it talks about people who take the mark of the beast. All right, so the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of identify keywords or phrases and related concepts. Okay, then I'm going to cross-reference some passages I might look up some of the keywords in the Strong's Concordance. 
I'm going to find all the places in scripture where those keywords may be used and related ideas. I'm going to be looking for patterns because remember, prophecy is pattern. Okay, we were looking for patterns. I'm going to look for patterns like within the book of Revelation itself and then patterns that may go back into other scriptures. I'm going to create a hypothesis. Okay, that is, I'm going to say from the things that I've read, from the passages of scripture that I've looked at, from the meanings of the words that I've seen from not the King James Version or any other English version of the Bible, I'm looking at the original Greek and Hebrew words. What does it mean there? And I'm not a Greek scholar. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to be able to look at the original language and just learn some things from the definition and the context and how these words are used in other, other places. I'm going to create a hypothesis about what the mark is or the people who take the mark and create a hypothesis about people who do not take the mark. And then I'm going to check my work. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to say, look at my hypothesis, and I'm going to see, are there any other passages of Scripture that seem to confirm what I'm saying? Does my hypothesis have any kind of conflict anywhere else in the Bible? And can this conflict be resolved Okay, so that my hypothesis may still stand. And does my hypothesis make sense in the context of the Revelation story? All right, so all of this sounds kind of like the scientific method, right? Because <laughs> that's what we're doing here. We're actually going to, you know, use God's word and we're going to investigate it. It's, it's a... It's a detective story. It's, a, it's an investigation. We're not doing a pretty Bible study, okay? It's not a pretty Bible study where we're just going to go on the surface and try to see what it says on the surface, okay? We're going to go and ask some hard questions. And I just want to say this, that once I started getting into the whole um, Bible study here of who takes the mark of the beast, that it led me to some very scary places, not scary if you're a Christian, okay? Not scary if you're a Christian, but places though where I had to actually put my pen down, get get my, I had to just kind of stop and just put my head in my hands and go, oh my gosh, this is this is far more frightening, far more frightening than any certain injection would ever be. Okay, there were uh, seriously there was probably about four times where I had to just stop and go, I, I'm really having a hard time with what I'm seeing here. All right, so we're going to talk about this in the next Bible study. I want you to stick with me. Don't go away. Don't be discouraged because this looks like it's going to be hard. I'm going to walk you through this. I'm going to try to make it easy for you by giving you an example so you can see how how I do this, and this is basically what I've done for the whole book of Revelation. It's what I did in my Bible studies on Matthew 24, analyzing the intel. Okay. It's how I approach Bible study. Okay, And the wonderful thing here is that we, we're not doing this all by ourselves. We're not doing this alone. We're doing it, first off, you know, by doing it publicly, I have you guys out there who are going to add to or ask questions about what I'm doing, what I'm thinking. And I have opportunity to explain myself. Sometimes I will point you to a previous Bible study that where I've done all of this hard work and I can't explain it in a comment section, okay? Because I'm not doing this over here. I'm doing this, okay? And there are people who, you know, who aren't going to want to, you know, look at the video I recommend for whatever reason. But if I recommend a video where I've already talked about it, it's because I've done this and it's too hard to describe it in a comment section. The other thing that we have beside each other, we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our teacher and he instructs us in these things. There are so many times when the Holy Spirit will sort of highlight a verse, highlight a word, in the passage and kind of basically say, hey, follow this one. 
this is the one I want you to follow. I want you to follow this trail. That's the voice I'm always listening for. I'm listening for the voice of the Spirit that says, hey, why don't you go down this way? Why don't you check that out? See what that has to say. And when I do that, a lot of times, well, just about every time, where I have actually discerned the voice of the Spirit in these things, everything gets really big, okay, number one. That's, is, to me, that's one of the hallmarks of the Holy Spirit moving, is that everything gets big, it gets brighter, and in the case of the people who take the mark, um, this opened up um, a vista that was really so big that it was kind of terrifying. Okay, it was terrifying for me. And we're going to talk about this in, in an upcoming video. It's going to touch on things like the book of life, what it means to be saved, what is the whole idea of election, free will, predestination. All of these are going to be avenues that we're going to be looking at when we do an exegetical study on the mark of the beast and who takes the mark. So I hope you will just continue with me through this Bible study series because I think, number one, you're going to learn how to do Bible study and you're going to see that the, the easy answers that people give, the, the easy theology that people have, is, is actually gets destroyed when you, when you do this, when you actually take the time to do a for reals Bible study. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what I have to give you today. I'm sure I've left you hanging on the edge of your seat there, I hope. So in the next Bible study, we'll just sort of pick up where we left off here, and we will actually dig into the passages that talk about the mark of the beast. Till then, I hope you will do your own research on that, and I'm sure you will come up with some very interesting things. And even if you don't do a lot of research, at least you'll be thinking about what all this means so that when I start to talk about it, you'll at least be familiar with the subject. All right, so we'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.